He is at the shoulder. He will, the command would then be given load by word. Open pan. He first has to open the pan and make sure that it's clear. Hand, handle cartridge. He brings a cartridge up to his mouth. He tears the cartridge open. Inside this paper cartridge is powder and a round ball. Prime. He pours some of the powder into the pan. Shut pan. Closing it, securing that powder in the pan. He automatically casts his weapon about. Load. Now he pours the rest of the powder down the barrel, puts the ball on top, and starts to draw his rammer. Draw rammer. Ram cartridge. He's now seated that ball on top of the powder at the bottom of the barrel. Return rammer. He automatically comes to the shoulder. Make ready. You might want to hold your ears, put your uh, protectors in. Take aim. Fire. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> shoulder arms. Um, where are we? In 1840 was the very last time that flintlock muskets were made in the United States because of a new invention right here called the percussion cap. Looks like a little brass top hat has a chemical inside called fulminate of mercury, which is a high explosive on impact. The weapon loads almost exactly the same as what you saw in the flintlock era, except that now you load your musket first and you prime it second, because that cap fits right on this nipple in the back of the breech. This is a model 1842 musket, smooth bore, <clears throat> the first weapon made in the United States with all interchangeable parts. Even though the technology was known, this is the first time they achieved it. And I have Sergeant Hall over here in his uniform of 1852, the fatigue uniform, and he's going to fire that for you. As you see, you're loading first and putting the percussion cap on last. The percussion cap will fire in the rain, which is another innovation over the flintlock. The idea is to try to get three aimed shots in one minute. Notice the little pouch on the front of his belt that he uses to carry the caps. Now later on when we got into a little thing called the Civil War or the war between the states, anybody here from the South? The War of Northern Aggression? A new invention had come along. They found a way to change the musket so you could still load and fire it just as fast as the regular musket, but now it has rifling in the barrel. And they could do that because of the invention of a new bullet. A conical bolt with a hollow base and ridges on the side. So when you fire it, the gases from the explosion cause the skirts of the bullet to swell and fill the rifling, and now you get directed fire. The weapon that usually was accurate up to about 100 yards, now in the hands of an average Marine, could put a bullet in a man 300 yards or better. So it revolutionized warfare. But other inventions were happening at the same time. The Civil War saw all kinds of technologies coming into being. And breech loaders came in as well. And here's one of the first types called the sharps. When you pull this lever down, the whole breech drops out. You still use a paper cartridge, but now the bolt is in the front end. You put the bolt and paper in, and when you pull this lever, it cuts off the back of the cartridge and exposes the powder. You still use the percussion cap for ignition, but now, instead of getting three shots in a minute, you could get six to eight shots in a minute. When John Brown was at Harper's Ferry and the Marines had to go root him out, John Brown's men had these. The Marines had the weapon you just saw him firing. Uh, 
other technology would come into play. For instance, you were officers. Up until this time, an officer was not allowed to carry a firearm. But by the Civil War era, it became painfully obvious that he needed some kind of personal protection, and the revolver provided that. However, it's strictly for personal defense. To load it, you've got to take it apart by knocking this wedge out. you still got to load it just like you do the musket, and you still got to ram the powder, the ball against the powder. And you still got to cap each cylinder. So it's very slow, but again, for your own use. Other technologies came up, repeating weapons. First, there was a Spencer, which could fire eight shots before you had to reload, and we started to use metallic cartridges. Here we have a Henry, could load up to 16 shots before you had to reload. Whenever you're ready. And as a quartermaster sergeant of the Civil War era, it'd be very hard for me to resupply him with ammunition. But you'll find out more about metallic cartridges by moving to the next era. Okay, welcome to the latter half of the 19th century. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Callahan. I know you already met uh, Gunnery Sergeant Williams. And we're going to describe to you a period when the United States is going from the first Industrial Revolution to the second Industrial Revolution. And the key innovation that's going to bring about with respect to firearms technology is this going to be this thing right here. It is the metallic cartridge, which allows you to combine the bullet, the powder, and the primer, all in one self-contained unit that you can mass produce and, uh, and really make some important changes in the way that you can use firearms. The other thing that's going to be important to bring, getting the most out of this technology is going to be those breech-loading weapons you heard about. In this case, Goodery Sergeant Williams is holding up the rolling block Remington M1870, or Model 1870. This was adopted by the uh, Navy in 1870 or 1871. And uh, as you can see, it gets its name from that ro rotational block, a semicircular block that comes up and, and locks the chamber closed. Unfortunately, the only thing holding it in place once that round is fired is the hammer itself. Now, the Marine Corps at this time was a little bit slow to adopt this technology, preferring instead to try and convert muskets to breech loaders. When the Marines went ashore with sailors at the Sally River forts in Korea in 1871, they quickly figured out that this was a superior weapon, and the Marine Corps got on board. Now, in 1873, which is a short time afterwards, the Army is going to go to the Model 1873 Trapdoor Springfield. The Navy and Marine Corps, having just adopted that former weapon, are going to take about 11 years to get around to this in 1884. Why is it called the Trapdoor Springfield? Well, it has this drop-down breech block, much like a trapdoor, which closes to seal the chamber off. It fires a 45 caliber round, which the rifleman would feed in, then drop the breech block down, locking it in place, and he's going to cock the hammer and fire his round. Okay, we might have a malfunction there, but as you can see, after he would fire each round, he would raise the breech block and eject that round. So he basically can fire as fast as he can get rounds into the chamber. The key limitation here is we're talking manually loading. Now, in 1895, the Navy's going to adopt the Lee Navy or the, the Lee Straight Pull Remington Rifle. This weapon is an improvement in the sense that it has an entire bolt which is used to seal off the chamber. Unfortunately, the name Lee Straight Pull will reveal just how deficient this was in terms of its design. When the bolt is slid forward, the only thing holding it in place is a rather primitive cam on the right side of the weapon, and it was notoriously unreliable. It fired a 6mm round and had an internal magazine, so those represent some other improvements. One of the chief things we're going to find about this weapon is they didn't buy very many of them. So when they get into the Spanish-American War and they need to increase the size of the Navy and Marine Corps dramatically, a lot of Marines and sailors are going to be using these uh, trapdoor springfields. Now, getting into the Philippine insurrection, the crucible of sustained combat, we're going to find the need for another weapon, and the Navy and Marine Corps are going to adopt the Model 1898 Craig, which is based on an 1892 design that was adopted by the Army. It is fed by a rotary magazine with a side gate to, to feed the rounds in, fires a 30 caliber round, and up to four rounds can be fed into that internal magazine. Now we have a rotational bolt, which is a much better locking mechanism and much more reliable. And you'll see an increased rate of fire here 
when the gunnery sergeant uses the internal magazine to uh, rapidly bring, bring around under the uh, trigger rather than having to manually feed each one in. Due to its widespread use by the, both the Marine Corps and also by the Army, this has been an iconic weapon symbolizing U.S. imperialism, hence the phrase, civilize them with a Craig. We'll talk briefly about sidearms. The first uh, mass-produced sidearm that the U.S. military is going to use to adopt this kind of technology is going to be the 45 caliber uh, single-action army. It uh, is a single-action weapon fed with that 45 caliber round into a fixed cylinder. And you can see that for every round the gunnery sergeant fires, he's got to manually cock the weapon. Notice how he's using his sight picture every time. This is going to be replaced in 1892 by the 38 long Army and Navy. It's a Colt weapon with a cylinder that can be rotated to the side with six rounds loaded. This is a double action weapon, so notice that this time when he fires, he doesn't have to destroy his sight picture for each shot. And one of the chief dis disadvantages they found with this weapon is that 38 caliber didn't really convey the kind of stopping power they wanted to uh, deal with uh, Moro Insurrectos in uh, close combat. And so the 45 was brought back into widespread use. Let's talk briefly about how this is going to impact tactics. First of all, I know you can appreciate that we have a much higher rate of fire being brought about here by these new technologies. Think about rifled weapons now, also increasing the accuracy of the weapon. And then uh, in addition with all that, uh, you've got many more of these things on the battlefield. The bottom line is the battlefield is becoming a much more lethal place to be than it was beforehand. How do you adapt to that? Well, to begin with, those linear tactics, think of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War that have existed for about 200 years, those are going to fall by the wayside. In the defense, you're going to dig in. Okay, in the offense, you're going to exercise dispersion and spread out, and also we're going to depend on small unit leadership. And then lastly, if you can find an opportunity to seek cover and concealment, for example, firing from the prone position, it's a really nice advantage now that we don't have to stand up and go through a manually loading procedure using the muzzle of the weapon um, and exposing yourself to the enemy that whole time. In terms of uh, edged weapons, we haven't talked about that a whole lot. Swords are now pretty much going to be relegated very quickly to a ceremonial role. And even bayonets, because we're killing people at much longer distances, are something that are going to be used as weapons of last resort only for close combat. So this is not the preferred way of fighting. Lastly, I'll discuss the uniforms. Towards the end of the period, this is what the undressed uniform would have looked like for Marines serving board ship. It was pretty well suited for that, but maybe not such a great uniform to be worn when you're in the jungles of uh, the Philippines or perhaps ashore in Cuba. One of the first things they do is adopt an army field cover, which is much better suited than maybe the kepi that you saw in some of the earlier, earlier lanes. Also, the Marines are going to rapidly figure out that they can modify this uniform, do things like discard the jacket and wear the uh, shirt sleeves undershirt, essentially, as their outer garment. Finally, when they go to the Philippines, they're going to combine other uniform items like tan trousers, things with earth tones in them that might be a little more appropriate to uh, be in an environment we don't necessarily want to be seen by an enemy who's trying to kill you and has an accurate weapon. So the bottom line for this period is you come out of a 50-year interval with the United States Marine Corps professionalizing and modernizing alongside the other services and keeping pace. And this is going to be really important because when you get into the 20th century and there's an opportunity to embrace a new unique mission and find a new unique identity for the Marine Corps, it's going to be able to do that.